Now we enter into our discussion of the first major division of the Torah, which we know as Genesis. And uh, it is uh, interesting to take a look at uh, the designations that have been given uh, to these individual sections of uh, the Torah. The, uh, the Hebrews were not very creative. They just took the initial words. They just called this first part of the Torah in the beginning. Better she, just, just exactly how the, uh, the book begins. But in, in many ways, when you think about it, Genesis is the beginning. It's the beginning, obviously, of creation the world around us, it's the beginning of man, the beginning of sin, uh, the, uh, the beginning before sin, obviously, of uh, social interaction, marriage, um, beginning of God's judgment, uh, the flood, uh, all the way to the beginning of Israel, which uh, becomes a very, very important part of uh, the last uh, great section of the book. So it is a book of beginnings, and in some ways the, the Greek emphasizes exactly the same with the term Genesis. As the idea again of that which is brought forth, that which is generated, uh, looks at uh, the beginning, the origin, the source, of what is being uh, described. So what is, the, what is the genesis of the human race? What is the genesis of sin? What is the genesis of judgment? What is the genesis of Israel? And so you can see that, uh, that the term, and they base it upon the, uh, the Greek for these are the generations of the Toledot formula that uh, is very much a part of the structure of, of Genesis. So, uh, so when we think in terms of uh, the titles, they orientate us, both the Jewish and the, and the uh, Greek titles, to the fact that in Genesis, all right, here's the beginning. Here's, here's what you need to know. Here's the foundation, what's going to follow in the rest of the Torah. Significantly, uh, Genesis has the longest chronological stretch, the longest uh, chronological narrative as far as any portion of the Bible is concerned. It goes all the way from creation, and we don't know exactly when that was. I can say probably very strongly some time before 404 B.C., when James Usher said that creation took place. Um, he based that upon closed genealogies. I believe at least the genealogy of Genesis 11 probably has some, uh, uh, has some uh, 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 openness in it that is not direct. It's talking about ancestry and not direct father to son necessarily. It could be a father to a great, 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 great grandson the third and fourth generation. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, most would say that uh, creation is probably no further back than about uh, 6,000 to 10,000 B.C. And it comes all the way to 1800 B.C. with the death of Joseph. So for James Usher, we're, you know, we're dealing obviously with a little over 2,000 years of human history. Uh, possibly closer to four to six thousand years of human history, that is uh, in the uh, the book of uh, of Genesis, so-called. So obviously, this is uh, you know a uh, a vast movement, and and Moses in the first eleven chapters deals with the bulk of that history very very quickly. He certainly highlights it and then slows down. Because Abraham was born in 2166 BC, and uh, so a little over 350 years are covered 
in the last 39 chapters of the book. So Genesis already is starting to, to slow down. And again, as far as the history of the interpretation, uh, the, uh, the new dictionary for the theological interpretation of the Bible introduces most of the books with a little thumbnail sketch of how the book has been understood in, uh, in history. And uh, the commentary by Matthews that I will recommend in the NAC also has uh, some, uh, some good discussion as far as the history of interpretation. He actually begins by saying, you know, the interpretation of Genesis did not begin in the Enlightenment. It goes back to Jewish and, and the Christian interpretation before the critical approach. And I've already brought out the, uh, the ancient commentary on Christian scripture. Significantly, there are two volumes that are devoted to Genesis. Let me make a, a quick statement. It's interesting. Volume 3 covers Exodus to Deuteronomy as a whole with basically the same length as the two volumes on Genesis. And uh, that's not, well, we just want to get Exodus through Deuteronomy done a lot quicker because uh, it, it's the fact that in both Jewish and particularly in, I'm sorry, sorry not in, in uh, Jewish, in Christian um, interpretation, more time has been spent on Genesis than the rest of the Torah combined. You go through 2,000 years of church history, you take a look at all that's been written on these different sections of the Torah. And as I said, Genesis has been preached on and been written on, has more commentaries on it from the, in Christian history than the other four sections combined. So for Christians, Genesis is the most important part of the Torah. And Wenham, who writes the introduction in Dictionary of Theological Interpretation of the Bible, says, and for Christians, the particular part of Genesis that we have tended to study through the last 2,000 years is Genesis 1 to 11. And our president is a good illustration of that. He has preached through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. He's never done a series from 12 through 50, verse by verse. Now, he's obviously preached passages here and there. But he's never said, I'm going to spend time now going through Genesis 12 to 50 or the rest of the Torah or outside of Daniel and Zechariah, anywhere else in the, uh, the Old Testament. And uh, this, is, this is very much like, uh, uh, like uh, church history. And, uh, and now we also have a Reformation commentary on Scripture. It goes back to the Reformers, and Volume 1 again deals with the very beginning of Genesis. So with these three volumes, you can see what the early church fathers and the Reformers have uh, had to say about uh, passages in the book of Genesis. And uh, they are well worth looking at. Uh, again, you're not the first one to come to these uh, chapters. You know, what of those who've gone before? Uh, seen in Genesis. So, uh, and uh, Wenham says that, uh, and here's the difference between Christians and Jews, that as you take a look at, uh, at the writings and the preaching that has taken place, Christians have tended to take a look at Genesis 1 to 11. The Jewish tradition tends to concentrate more on 12 to 50, as you would imagine, Abraham and particularly Israel. So, um, and, and, and I might as well say at this point that in the history of Jewish interpretation, the most important part of the Torah for them is not Genesis, even Genesis 12 to 50. The most important part of the Torah for Jews to this day is Leviticus. The place you die is the place they begin. <laughs> All right. We come to Leviticus. What's it here? The Jewish rabbis, scholars still come to Leviticus and say, ha ha, this is what we need to dig ourselves into as, as uh, those who follow Moses.
And uh, so, uh, but in Genesis, they concentrate upon the ancestral histories of the fathers, Abraham and uh, Israel. We tend to take a look, and rightfully so, at the pre-Israel history, pre-Abraham history of Genesis 1 to 11, which culminates in the table of the nations in Genesis chapter 10. So why are we interested in, you know, Genesis 1 to 11? Because that's our national ancestry. You know, we, uh, we understand our association with Adam and we understand our association, you know, with Noah and uh, with his sons. But, um, but of course with Abraham, we from the New Testament know he's the father of faith, but uh, when it comes to the fact he's the father of Israel, all right, we don't tend to want to listen quite as extensively. And then by the time when you get to chapter 25 with Jacob, uh, and I know, did you find, uh, did, didn't you find it easier to read the first 25 chapters of Genesis than the last 25 chapters of Genesis? You got to Jacob, and you kept saying, come on, when's, when's, when's this guy going to get with it? <laughs> I mean, he seems to have a heart for God, and he's just a deceiver. And deception again, 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 of course, the Lord turns the tables on him in the latter part of Genesis when he is deceived. And ultimately, he's, he's the, the man finally of faith in 46 to 50. We, we finally see God has kind of worked out the guile, and now we see the patriarch who is willing to trust God. All right, well, that's, uh, that's the, the background to Genesis. Let's now start to think about the, uh, the major themes of the book. And certainly, we've already seen some of the themes uh, as we've looked at the themes of the Torah, but what about Genesis as, it, as uh, itself? And, and the first thing we realize in Genesis 1 to 11, we'll come back to this next week with the structure. But do you realize that Moses tells you more about the flood than he does about creation? That the longest Toledot in Genesis 1 to 11 is the Toledot of Noah that begins in 6 9 and goes all the way through chapter 9, verse 29. That there's more emphasis on the flood and its aftermath than there is with creation and its aftermath. So why is it important? Well, the beginning of the flood narrative, we see for the first time God speaks of a covenant. He says in chapter 6, verse 18, to Noah, but I will establish my covenant with you. I'm bringing the flood. The whole earth is going to perish. You and your family members and the animals that are with you on the ark, that's all that's going to survive. And I'm going to establish my covenants, a covenant I'm going to make with you. And so that is, uh, that's the backdrop, the anticipation of a covenant. A covenant which is spelled out beginning in chapter 8 verse 20, all the way through chapter 9, verse 17. The flood has come to an end. And so in chapter 8, verse 20, and Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now a burnt offering has not been mentioned previously within the Torah. 
But you've got to realize that Israel on the plains of Moab knew very, very well what a burnt offering was. They had grown up with the concept of the offerings that God gave at Sinai. And the first major offering that Yahweh spoke that was vital for His people in maintaining fellowship and a relationship with Him in Leviticus was Leviticus chapter 1, the burnt offering. And the burnt offering, as we read in Leviticus chapter 1, was a recognition on the part of the offerer, first of all, that he was a sinner. And that there needed to be a ransom paid, there needed to be a substitute accepted by God for his forgiveness and for the fact that uh, sin would no longer be a barrier between he and his God. The majority of the animal was consumed in smoke. That's why in some translations you read it's the whole burnt offering. It is completely consumed. And uh, shows that a sinner realizes on the basis of an offering, a substitute offering, that he is acceptable before God as a sinner can be forgiven. And as a forgiven sinner, just like that offering, he is, he is uh, committing himself totally in dedication to the Lord. Now when Israel on the plains of Moab heard that Noah offered burnt offerings on the altar, they would realize that in that he's recognized, recognized himself as a sinner, that these offerings are being consumed as a substitute for his forgiveness, and that he is making a wholehearted renewal of commitment to the Lord. All of that in the off of burnt offerings on the altar. By the way, if you didn't pick up Leviticus by that point, chat verse 21, and the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And of course, Leviticus 1, and again, Israel would know. I mean, I told you again and again, we're going we're gonna to say it. We can interpret this because this is what Israel in the plains of Moab would have understood. And they know that the, the burnt offering is the first of the sweet savor, sweet salt smelling, sweet aroma to the Lord offerings that, uh, that they brought. And so the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, on the basis of Noah's confession and commitment implied, I will never again curse the ground on account of men. Even though, probably better understood, even though the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. When he says I will never again curse, what he means by this is he's not going to add to the curse that has been given in Genesis chapter 3. Even after Noah, man is still going to decay and die along obviously with the creation. The, the ground is cursed, but no additional curses. Even though sin remains, God will never again judge it in the way that he has done. In fact, the curse of the ground is now going to be ameliorated with God's blessing in verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. That yes, even though the ground is cursed and man has to sweat, 
the ground is no longer antagonistic to man because God will bring the water at the proper time. He will bring the sun at the proper time. There is a regularity of, of sowing and reaping that is now going to be man's lot until the very end it shall not cease. Uh, so, uh, so gentlemen, as, uh, as long as day follows night, continually, uh, the Noahic covenant is in effect. As long as, uh, as winter comes to an end, I mean, as summer comes to an end, we can anticipate winter. And in the middle of winter, we'll anticipate summer. And uh, this heat spell will not last forever. Aren't you glad? There'll come a day in January you will you will long for a day of September. Oh, to be to be thawed out of this chill. Some of you just moved here, you won't get chilled this year, but you will next year, uh, 2015, if the Lord tarries. Uh, your blood will thin, and you will become just like the rest of us who will die when the temperature goes below 40, and say how cold this is blizzard-like temperatures. <laughs> And you can't wait for the heat of summer. And during the heat of summer, you can't wait for it to get cold again. It's, that's God's oversight of nature based upon the Noahic Covenant. And because of that, man can know exactly when to plant, exactly when to seed, and exactly how long after to harvest. It's regular. It's... Uh, it, uh, it, it ameliorates the cursing of the ground that had taken place in Genesis chapter 3. And so this regularity shall not cease. And God in chapter 9 commits himself to the fact that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. 9.15 um, I remember my covenant, and never again shall the earth become a flood to destroy all flesh. And by the way, God just said he'd never destroy by a flood. He didn't say anything about fire. <laughs> but you see, the flood destroyed all flesh except for eight individuals. And even in the future, though there will be judgment, it will never be as total and complete as was an Noahic flood. Again, even as the curse is ameliorated with God's gracious blessing, even His judgment in the future, even what the world anticipates as it looks forward to the day of the Lord will not be as totally catastrophic as what took place in the days of Noah. It's going to be, again, ameliorated, tinged with God's blessing. God. God will never again bring the whole human race down to just eight people left. Why? Well, because he's also promised to save some out of every family of the earth, but that's the Abrahamic covenant. Not just one family. There's going to be salvation every family of the earth. So aren't you glad you live this side of the flood? as well as the side of the cross. And then uh, God blessed Noah and his sons. Now even though God speaks, Noah receives and his sons receive. As you can see, there are imperatives, there are commands that are given to Noah. Just as there's going to be commands that are given to Abraham. That uh, these covenants are not commandment free. What are the commands? God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And you've heard that before. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 28, 
God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And goes on, and, sub and, and subdue it and rule over the fish, the birds, and uh, the every living thing that moves on the earth, the, the creatures that have God had created. Same thing here. And now God is going to help. You be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and as you do, the fear of you and the terror of you will be upon every beast of the earth, every bird, everything that creeps, all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. Given for what? To sub okay, you don't have to subdue them anymore. If you'll obey, they will fear and you will rule. So to Adam, you subdue it and you rule over them. Now God says, in the way of covenant, you just obey by multiplying and filling the earth, and I'll bring the fear that leads to the animals being in your hand, that is, under your control, under your rule. So what we have in the Noahic Covenant is a reaffirmation, now in covenant form, of what God had told Adam at the beginning. Not only the, the vegetation, verse 3, but also um, uh, in uh, verse uh, uh, 3, you can eat that which is alive. Animals, every moving thing that's alive shall be food for you. I give it to you as I gave the green plant. By the way, it's very interesting here that in the flood, distinction already been made between clean and unclean animals. Remember, there's additional clean animals because that's what Noah offered. Two by two of every, but there's additional of the clean. So there's some kind of distinction. Yet, it's interesting here for Noah, every moving thing that's alive shall be food for you. Now, this is pre-Acts 10. But for Noah, he can eat of any animal, clean and unclean. Now, later, the restriction on the Torah for Israel is going to be what? You cannot eat the unclean, only the clean. We'll come back to what clean and unclean might mean when we get to Leviticus. But, uh, but the, this is the only requirement, verse 4, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. You can eat the animal, but it's be completely drained of the blood, and you cannot take the blood and eat that by itself. By the way, notice that that is not Leviticus 17 for Israel. This is given to Noah and his sons, from whom, chapter 10, all the nations come. This is a requirement. And your lifeblood, whoever sheds man's blood, be it animal or person, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he has made man. As for you, once again, be fruitful, multiply, populate the earth abundantly, and multiply in it. Fruitful, multiply, populate, abundantly, multiply. God, just like in Genesis chapter 1, and what he will do with, with, uh, with Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, and what we'll see take place in Israel and Egypt, Exodus chapter 1, these these term after term which emphasizes multiplication, increase. Because this is the essence of blessing. God's blessing is seen in multiplication, in increase, in being fruitful, and filling, and filling the earth abundantly. Uh, by the way, gentlemen, in God's economy, 
if I might put it, put it this way, the, uh, the Earth's ability to support humankind is not meager, it is bountiful. Man's problem is not that he lives on an earth that has dwindling resources. Man's problem is he rebels against the God who has given those resources to him. So famines are not the results of, uh, of the fact that God cannot abundantly provide. Famines are the result of the fact that man is in rebellion against God, and so God does what? He withholds the, uh, the fruitfulness that the earth is very, very capable of bringing forth even under its cursed condition. That was for free. Sorry, I got onto that. Modern ecology, be careful. But uh, mankind... All right, is also to practice capital punishment. Man as, and here there's some corporality. And so uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, spell out the requirements of man under the Noahic covenant. And then God swears that he is going to fulfill the promises that he has made. And he is going to bring blessing upon Noah's seed as uh, they will obey uh, his commandments. And yes, uh, we can say that uh, verses 1 through 7 are commandments that are given to Noah's seed. And yet obeying that command, those commandments in no way is going to change God's faithfulness to the covenant, the promise he made in uh, verses 21 and 22 of chapter 8, the promises he makes in verses 8 to 17 sealed by the sign of the rainbow in the sky, that God is determined never again to judge man as totally and completely as he had done in the flood. Which means that God has committed himself, no matter what the response of mankind is, ultimately, as we're going to see next week in the Abrahamic covenant, to save some out of every family of mankind. Every family, not every nation, every family is going to be represented in those that God is going to deliver and bless in the future. When? At the end of the days. And so there, there is a sense in which what we have looked at here in Genesis 8, 21 through 9, 17 is, is the high points an important takeaway for, from Israel from the first 11 chapters. Now we're going to fit it as we take a look next week more at the flow of Genesis into its, uh, you know, into its uh, literary uh, uh, context. But gentlemen, this is, this is in many ways one of those most important passages of the Torah which is overlooked. Don't overlook it. God's entering into a covenant with Noah and his seed and with every living creature that he has created. So gentlemen, um, if you're not of the seed of Noah, you're outside of this covenant. But you're not. And by the way, Every one of your animals, the dogs and cats, God bless them, because I don't. <laughs> dogs, birds, I, you know, he, he, former professor loves snakes. He's got, a, he's got a pet snake. Lord bless him. Um, notice the covenant is made not only with all of mankind, it's made with all of the animals. By the way, your dog does a better job of having faith in the way of covenant than you do. I know that from Romans 8. All creation is groaning, waiting for the revelation of the, of, uh, the, uh, the sons of God. Uh, your dog is saying, would you hurry up and get it together? 
I want to be in a blessed earth that knows the fullness of God's abundance. <laughs> By the way, I mean, if, if at the end of the day God wants to abundantly bless man with his food, just think, just think for your dog how much dog food there's going to be. Yeah. Ever thought about that in the kingdom? Not only aren't you going to go hungry, your dog's not going to go hungry. Your cat, Lord bless him, is not going to go hungry. Your, your bird, that's a Noahic covenant. And so God pledges himself by a covenant oath to the well-being of mankind. What is mankind's response? Uh, the same as it was before the flood. Uh, a lot of correlation will bring up between Genesis 6 and Genesis 11. But God doesn't bring a flood. He scatters the people because he had said, you know, populate the earth. So he makes sure they populate the earth. He scatters them. And then out of that scattering, he chooses an individual and enters into a covenant with him, a covenant with Abraham. And that's where we'll pick it up next, uh, next Wednesday.